Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, former vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee. And this video, this recording, podcast, whatever, is just kind of me reflecting on the National Convention and 2020 altogether. Um, and just sort of the end of uh, my term. Okay, so 2020 was a weird year for the Libertarian Party. And overall, like, this particular term... Um, on the on sea was filled with a lot of challenges. And just to kind of recap, uh, we kind of went into it with a deficit budget um, from the previous LNC, um, partly because, you know, it was an election year. People wanted to spend, make sure there was a lot of money spent on the 2016 campaign. Um, also, there was a lot of ballot access issues in 2018. So a lot of money was spent and a lot of that was spent from money that was collected for the 2018 convention. So basically there was, uh, you know, there was, there was initially a financial struggle and initially sort of a, a leadership struggle as basically um, the current, ex- at the time, the executive director, uh, Wes Benedict, was leaving. Um, so then there was this whole search for a new executive director. So you had all these sort of uh, financial issues, sort of logistical issues, kind of all piling up on the LNC, right, literally right out of the gate. At the same time, um, many of us kind of had different things uh, going on that 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 put put stresses on our time. So, you know, we went into this term uh, with some pretty hefty challenges right before us from the get go, and in a large part due to uh, Joe Bishop Henchman and Richard Longstreth, we were able to work through the budget issues at the budget meeting at the end of the, of the first year, at the end of twenty eighteen, and. Then sort of the next issue was just sort of the ED search. So the, the first half of 2019 was searching for a new ED. Eventually, uh, Dan Fishman is hired and selected as the ED. And then, you know, after that, we find out that the development director, uh, Lauren Darty has decided to, to make her exit at that point. And this kind of causes other, uh, you know, and then that's a lifeblood in the sense that, the you know, being able to raise funds and Lauren Darty had done a great job. Um, so it was certainly sad to see her exit the organization. Um, but th- this created some other new conflicts I'm not, that I'm not necessarily going to get into as far as the process by which we select the next development director. Um, you know, and then different people had different feelings about sort of how open that process was, how opaque or transparent that process was, um, which kind of, that sort of plagued the latter half of 2019, okay, um, and again, those are two crucial pieces, executive director and development director, so it's kind of hard to sort of maneuver and take bigger actions as a party when you don't have someone who's at the helm of staff and you don't have someone who's keeping the lifeblood going with the fundraising, so pretty much for pretty much until the end of 2019, during this term of uh, of, of the LNC, we had to solve a financial crisis and then solve these two big sort of human resource issues that pretty much prevented us from doing much else other than just normal disbursements for ballot access. Um, this and then you know deve- while the CRM is being developed, which both those things um, you know are funded by the LNC, but not necessarily stuff that we're as directly involved in. So again, there's this, this, this overall, this transitional stuff, okay, which is not a bad thing. This is all, uh, this is all the party nationally trying to sort of making this transition to sort of a new, new era in a sense, which it gets, you know, sort of gets its nice little exclamation point at the national convention. Um, but then 2020 rolls around and we have all these human resources issues. We have all these financial issues before us. We go to the, uh, Reno, um, LNC meeting and everything is pretty hunky dory. Okay. I mean, I, if I, if I remember correctly, there really was little contention about anything at the Reno and LNC meeting. Everyone, everyone was for the most part there. Everyone was, uh, in good spirits. Um, and this is like sort of the last time we all see each other before sort of the COVID, the air, you know, all the things are really changing with COVID, which really changed a lot of the dynamics um, and, you know, created a lot of the conflict that was, was to come. So we're trying to get closer and closer to the national convention. State conventions all over the country are being canceled or done online. And so basically the question keeps looming. Are we going to be able to hold our, conve- our Austin convention in May um, amid this sort of uh, medical pandemic? 
And as we get closer, become, it's becoming clearer and clearer that that's probably not going to happen. Okay, so the question is, what do you do about it? Okay, and essentially, I'm, I like to always think of myself like a Switzerland in the sense that I try to stay neutral. Not that I don't have an opinion, not that I'm not listening. It's just I try not to sit there and decide this is my position um, because I always want to make sure that I'm open to sort of all the arguments and, and constantly thinking about what's going on and assessing the situation uh, from minute to minute. And essentially, like, as I remember it, it just seemed like the argument came in sort of two different directions um, and thus sort of the divide on the LNC, uh, which led to a, sort of a lot of the conflict on the LNC towards the end. Um, that one side basically felt that either, either, okay, uh, or all, that one, canceling the convention or not holding a physical convention could lead to a rush of refunds that would result in so much funds having to be returned that it could put the national committee in, in, in pretty much in a place where it can't fund ballot access, can't fund all the, just basically in a real financial crunch. Two, um, bylaws issues, okay? Um, that if we don't follow the bylaws, this creates a vulnerability that when we do nominate a presidential candidate, that that presidential candidate's um, ability to get on the ballot will be further challenged beyond the already high ballot access challenges we have in 2020. Okay, because if you're not familiar with what's going on, is that generally to get on the ballot, we have to collect petition signatures. But in the world of COVID, it's pretty hard to get petition signatures. Um, you have less people who are willing to petition because they don't want to be socially distant. And less people who want to give signatures because they want to be distant from the petitioners. And um, so you have that issue. So there's been, you know, lawsuits and, 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 and basically filings to sit there and say, hey, this is not a normal year. These are not normal circumstances. And so in that situation, we should be granted relief from petitioning because it just, you know, it isn't fair to expect that we can hit these high burdens in such a high year. And I think some of some of those cases have come back and, you know, no, really, there's no relief. OK, so there'll still be other cases in other states, but in those states where we have to petition, we have to petition, and you're dealing with sort of a lot of competition from other uh, ballot initiatives, other candidates who are using the crop of professional petitioners. So um, rates might be higher than normal because, again, you have less petitioners because of, because of the situation. Um, those petitions are probably going to have to put in a lot more effort to get those petition signatures. So all these things kind of create a, a, a weird situation. So between those legal costs and petitioning costs, you know, having the potential where you have to spend more money on legal because, you know, the convention wasn't, all the T's weren't crossed, the I's weren't dotted, um, leading to potential people challenging it based on an improper nomination um, is, was a, something that people were worried about. You know, and again, how how serious that particular uh, concern is does vary from state to state because each state has different jurisprudence, and ballot access rules, uh, whatnot. So a lot of that did kind of not only come from splits in the committee, but splits in different states. And then there were other states and other groups who felt it irresponsible, okay, felt it irresponsible to hold some sort of physical event where you're asking people to kind of gather all in one place uh, for... Um, an event in a, during a, a, a health pa a pandemic. Okay. And you had states that were feeling very adamantly about because many of their delegates, um, you know, are immunocompromised and would not be able to participate in a physical convention. So you had this tension. You had this tension to do have some sort of alternative type convention to facilitate um, the situation that sort of everyone's sharing. Again, this is not like a normal year where maybe some people are sick, some people have this work, some people have this, but everyone's situation as to why they can't come is unique. And, but this here you have a situation where it's a national thing that's causing everybody to have a sort of a root cause of why they couldn't come coming from the sort of the same situation. To me, that is sort of substantially unique. Um, but you can't, you know, you never know who the judge is and how much leniency they're going to give to you because of the circumstances. 
so you had this tension sort of between sort of what's responsible towards the health and lives of our delegates versus what is sort of fiscally responsible um and everyone uh, uh, you know it always seemed that like everyone wanted to say like one answer was obvious to me it never was um i think what ended up happening was sort of the best that could have happened to address sort of everyone's concerns and again, the best that can happen still doesn't isn't always necessarily great. <laughs> you know, you do you you do the best you can with the cards you dealt, right? Um, but yeah, there was a lot of tension over that. It created some divides on the LNC uh, that did get not pretty, um, but it all worked itself out. I some bridges got a little bit burnt more than others, and that's unfortunate. Hopefully, you know, they get rebuilt. I'm always hopeful. I'm always um, for people being able to find each other again. Um, but yeah, so we, we get the so the the May May convention is canceled because it was impossible. The hotel had to cancel on us, so that was everyone agreed that I couldn't go. But this creates this also this other conflict of ballot access in the sense that if we don't nominate our candidates sooner than later then we run into an axis where we're going to be able to get them on all the ballots. So we need to nominate a, a candidate soon. So we did So we did have justification. We were able to find justification because it was impossible to hold a, a convention soon enough to carry out this activity that's sort of at the heart of what we do as a national party. Uh, you know, run a presidential candidate, kind of like the point of the national party. Um, you know, everything else can be done by state parties, running local candidates, you know, advocating, all that. You need a national party to really coordinate um, the presidential stuff, the stuff for the presidential years. That's that and just some, you know, financial support, um, you know, some between states. That's really what we do. OK. And maybe provide some resources to, to take advantage of some economies of scale. But it's this is a bottom up organization. The majority of the work is at the county level, then the state level, then the least amount of work is at the national level. And it's not that there isn't work. It's just the stuff that's going to have the most impact happens locally. So it we get to the point. Um, we have an LNC meeting in May to figure out what's going to happen. And the conclusion is I had the – yeah, that I think I had to run the majority of that meeting, if not almost all the meeting. Um, and – Basically, at that point, um, I had ruled that an internet is place, and I still that that logic still kind of pretty much makes sense to me in the sense that the you know it's a place where people are gathering, um, even if they're not physically occupying the same space. But you know, there's also this sort of tension to be defined, sort of the definition of a deliberative body and all this stuff. Whatever I ruled, how I ruled, it got overturned, and then um, a motion got passed by. Uh, Joe Bishop Henchman that basically was different in tenor. So basically before it was a discussion about whether we had the authority to do it normally. Okay, and that's where this whole place thing got and it got overturned. Then there's this whole issue, do we have authority to do it in the in the aura of impossibility and practicality? And in that in that you know, in that bubble where you have a situation where, you know, you have fairly high burdens to to doing it or outright impossibility um you know you could argue that that you could do it so we were able to do the first sitting the online convention um chaired by my nick by chairman nick Sawark. we were able to do that under that guise with and then basically that meeting adjourns and the adjourn motion adjourns specifically to a specific time and place um, in Orlando at the Shingle Creek, yada, yada, yada. And that brings us to where, and then like a week before that, um, we find out that the Shingle Creek can't, can't have us anymore. So then we have to shift everything over to the Orange County Convention Center. So from the COC's perspective, just to kind of give them their due, they planned a convention in Austin, it got canceled. Then they planned a convention again in the Shingle Creek, and then that got shifted on them. And they had to replan everything, um, you know, for the Orange County Convention Center. Luckily, Jim Turney had joined the COC. So having someone on the ground in Orlando, former chair Jim Turney, awesome guy, um, was someone on the ground there to really make sure that things worked out. And I am super thankful that that was the case. Um, 
parallel to that, after the first sitting, the online sitting, you know, me and a few others realized there was sort of a gap. So I know, like, as far as technologically how to handle people participating online. So literally that night after the the, the convention, because I had to share sort of the adjournment part of the online part of the convention, I went on Airtable and created like this little mini database application, um, not like a coded from the ground up application. I could do that, but, you know, if you can use a platform that already kind of has the infrastructure built in um, to do the thing, then I'd rather use a platform that kind of already has, um, especially when... You, when uh, so I built that, and it, it, it kind of helped spark some other ideas. And then you had basically two applications that were a little bit more robust being built out, one by Will McVeigh. Will McVeigh was kind of taking my idea with Airtable, incorporating that with Slack, and actually building a whole sort of check-in system, a whole... It basically using Slack bots. So you would basically check in to credentialing using Slack. You would be able to see the speaking queue using Slack. and it would, But it would be reading from that Airtable database. It was actually really clever. I, 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 I never realized that Slack was that robust as far as what you could do with it. So, I, um, And then there was the Porcupine app, which was done by um, TJ Ferreira and his team, which used, um, which was a JavaScript application using, uh, I think he, they were using socket.io for their, um, and it was really awesome, okay? Like, you could really do some really cool stuff. Like, not only could, does it manage the speaking queue, which was my particular concern, because that was the particular, the part I found particularly difficult about sharing the portion I did of the online sitting, but it handled, it could handle registration, it could handle timed polls, balloting, um, you know, it could do a lot, okay? And the demo seemed really promising. So the idea going into uh, Orlando was that this one app would sort of be sort of the, the heart of everything. Everybody would interact with this app. Um, and then this would speed everything up. So everyone was thinking this was going to be easy and smooth. I'd be able to look at the speaking queue. We were able to do the votes with everybody online and offline using the app. Unfortunately, there was some sort of bug, some sort of glitch that happened the day of. Um, but again, I'm still deeply, deep, deep, deep awe and appreciation of one, how much, what TJ was able to create in a very short period of time. And also the work he did to train people beforehand. That dude did not get sleep for days before that convention started. Um, you know, trying to get everything underway for that. So while it was unfortunate that it wasn't working the day of, the the sheer, you know, building such a robust app in such a short period of time. And I'm also a developer now, so I kind of, I do know what it takes to build those things. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, and uh, the time that he put in was pretty cool. Okay, so hats off to TJ Ferreira. Very awesome guy. Um, but unfortunately, there is a glitch. So we lose four hours in the first day. So basically, pretty much the whole morning part of the first day of the convention is just recess. Okay, and now I'm, you know, I don't want to, you know, like I'm, I'm freaking out because I'm running this huge event as the person presiding. And, you know, I've never presided over the entirety of an event like this. Um, well, I had presided for like a small portion of the 2018 convention after being elected vice chair and had done some parts of some LNC meetings in the final part of the, you know, this is a whole other bowl game. This had never been done before online and live delegates. And now I'm hearing that we're not going to have this app. Delegates are already frustrated because they've already lost half the day because we didn't really get started till 2 p.m. because of the technical difficulties. So, you know, I'm, I'm a bit nervous thinking that I already have a hostile crowd. And, um, you know, I already there's going to be I knew going in for the days literally like the first five days before this. I'm just literally studying law, big thinking about sort of the the oncoming dispute that's about to happen because what happened the week before. As we had the shift to the Orange County Convention Center, the LNC, we decide that we're not, everyone was feeling really uneasy, not sure that we are going to be able to have this convention in Orlando. We don't know if at the last minute it was going to get canceled by the Orange County Convention Center. So everyone felt pretty comfortable with putting the idea that the changing the location to the Orange County Convention Center and online and just planning on, so that way if the event got canceled, we'd have room to just automatically shift to doing an online proceeding instead of having to do another vote at that time. Now, was while there was an alternative wording proposed by Karen Ann Harlos, 
which in hindsight probably would have resulted in, in a, uh, and a little less headaches um, and a quicker day one. I I think I truly do in my heart of hearts believe that the way things happened was the way they had to happen. It wasn't the way I wish they had to happen. It wasn't the way I wish things had to go down. But I think it was the way it was meant to be and it wasn't so bad and I think there was a lot of good from it um, when you look at the bigger picture. Because when you're presiding over a meeting, it's not just the legalities of things. Um, it's not just facilitating the people who are at the event, but it's also trying to get people on the same page because you're, you're trying to do the business for an organization and you're trying to, to thread all these needles. And everyone's kind of focused on one needle, whether it's illegal stuff, whether it's the health issues, whether it's... But one of the things that I cared about quite heavily was creating an environment where everyone felt the environment was fair okay everyone felt that you know there was that we're moving forward as rocky as i knew it was going to be cons- all things considered considering the, the legal issues where they were going to come up right away with the credentials report considering the technical difficulties that i did not know were going to happen knowing things were going to be rocky um i just wanted to make sure that people at least felt that the person who's guiding them through it is in their corner Okay, and then that was sort of always sort of the, my mindset throughout the whole time. Like, whatever I do, I want to reassure that everybody, you know, we're on the up. Because at the end of the day, this isn't, this, this is going to be very imperfect. Um, especially since we had to switch to how we were going to vote. There's only going to be all these things that if people didn't have faith in the people executing it, they were going to drag out even further because they'd be fighting the way we had to do things. Okay? So having some, so literally a leap of faith was necessary to get what we did done. And the only way you can do that is if everyone can trust you. And that was, that was sort of always my goal um, going into this, which is why I took the tack that I did from the get-go with the credentials report. I knew both sides. I had talked to Mr. Richard Brown beforehand. I have talked to many of the parliamentarians who, who uh, were on the floor Challenging, challenging me for, throughout that first step. I knew where they were coming from. I knew the, 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 I knew what the dance would look like going into it. But to me, it was important to make sure that the online delegates knew that I was here to facilitate everybody's participation. And while yes, the the, I don't disagree that sort of the tightest legal safest way to do something was necessarily the way the parliamentarians want to do it that sort of be safe and you know above reproach i get i get all that um but sometimes the safest isn't always the safest in a sense because if i had just done that right from the get-go and sit there and say okay hey what we're gonna do is we're gonna take away the online delegates ability to participate and then give it back to them this would have created a lot of uneasiness um, also, I would have lost a lot of faith of 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 many of more than half the body, um, which would have made the next few days much harder. And so, it's so and plus I had already voted in for this situation, so it would seem inconsistent if I didn't continue to fight for it. Um, so I fought for it, um, and it was really like two hours. People think we spent nine hours in credentials report. We spent four because again we didn't actually get started with business till two. So the first two hours were, and not, I'm not even sure if it was really the first two hours, um, we spent about, that was basically with me trying to get it where we can just move forward from the credential report. And again, there was a lot more going on there than just sort of the vote on uh, amending and all this stuff. There was some other issues regarding um, just random questions people had about all sorts of things. Um, so we, we had spent a lot of time on a lot of other stuff, surproof. Surplu- surplu- <sighs> Superfluous, basically stuff that is not necessarily substantive to that core point. So again, that four hours that we did spend in the credentials report wasn't all just on okay, who are the online delegates? Who is a delegate? Who can participate in this vote? It wasn't just that. Okay, there was a lot of other time that got kind of wasted in there, in those early in those early moments. And again, this is after we've already lost half the day. So this is two p.m. to six p.m. So at a certain point, I realized, okay, once no sides, I'm not going to back down from where I'm, I'm at, okay? And the room is getting restless. And I don't want to lose that half of the room either. I don't want to, I don't want to, I need everyone to have faith in what's going on for this to work. Because otherwise, this isn't going to work. 
because there's just too there's too many things changing there's too many things that are we're literally having to figure out along the way that the only way to do this is if we're all having a little bit of faith in each other so i'm thinking and then i've already started having people come up to me and you know people who i consider friends but telling me you know um you know that we may have to vote to you know have you removed and you know have the x person or y person uh take over and understanding the different people that people wanted to take over each of them would result in my view in again not having that sort of unified faith in the system because these were people who were sort of obviously sort of either on one side or the other um you know and Omar Requero, someone who was the former vice chair of Florida, uh, chair of the of the uh, membership committee, you know, I know he's a good guy. I know he, you know, he isn't very uh, not part, not like, not a factional figure. But I also know that, but I know that he would make the rulings different than the rulings that I was making, and that's what we needed. We need someone who was just gonna get it done. Just let's do what the parliamentarian says, but someone who isn't necessarily going to, again, feel who still feels like a neutral party, someone who still feels like, OK, no, no one's going to be like, oh, this is this or this is that. Just someone who can just get it done and let us move forward. So that's why I handed the gavel off to Omar Requero, because there was no other way I could see moving through the blockade at that point. OK, I could have just stuck my guns and dragged things out for the next day and a half, but that doesn't seem very productive either. Um. And it worked out. He, he was able to break through that that gridlock. The credentials committee got report got passed, not in the way you know, not in a way that a lot of people would like. Honest, in hindsight, or what I wish would have happened is that some you know that instead of a motion to do this amendment to the credentials report, there would have just been a motion to suspend the rules, to ratify, or to you know acknowledge and then that just be that we moved forward do it as one compound motion i think everyone was still kind of finding their sea legs at this point um i still think that's i wish that was the way it had been done because then we, it would have been less contentious but again that's generally not how these things go um it's always a little what ends up being moved always ends up being a little too little or a little too much and uh you do the best you can with what the people in the people in the body move um, so then what happens, they get through that, Joe Bishop Henchman makes the motion, a compound motion to do the thing, to make sure the online delegates are delegates, right under the wire, like literally right before 6 o'clock, which was perfect, because that was my big fear. That was one of the reasons I really didn't want to go that route of taking it away and giving it back. The risk of the gap, the risk of what happens if we don't give back online delegates or ability to participate before the end of the day. And you go overnight with all these delegates who don't know if they can or can't participate. Um, that was really my deepest fear because that everything would have fallen apart at that point. Okay, um, you would have had states affiliating uh, delegates, you know, basically just angry. Okay, and and you you know it just would have been bad. Okay, luckily we avoided that. And luckily. Everyone worked together, and that's what happened. But that was day one. Day two went pretty smooth. We got some bylaws. We, 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 we moved forward. We got some reports done. We still lost like another hour, hour and a half due to technical difficulties because we were still trying to get the Porcupine app going. And then at that point, we, we, we just moved, fo- moved forward. I did bring in sort of my uh, you know, mock speaking cue thing and uh, with Airtable. Which helped, but again, at that point, it was just me running it. So I was like doing like double duty of basically managing a speaking queue at the same time as um, man- managing the room. So it, it was a it was a tricky day, but I think at that point, everyone was feeling a lot better, feeling a lot more, you know, in better faith about how things were going, and things were going smoothly. So day two was pretty smooth. Um, you know, there was some challenges here and there, but. We got through them fine and in good order. And day three was pretty good, um, but then we hit elections, and elections we run into some new challenges because again, originally we were going to use a Porcupine app. Everyone would be able to vote through the Porcupine app, and uh, we'd have results super quickly, and we'd be done with things. 
but we had to kind of go back to the old way. And the problem with it is when you have – it already took like an hour or so to do ballots. Like if you've been to any of the national conventions prior, it would take about an hour uh, to do each ballot at least. reason is is first every state would have to get – basically the way it generally works, every state has to collect all the votes from their, their people. Then they have to count the votes, make sure they're all good, then enter them on a tally sheet. The tally sheet gets then turned into the secretary. The secretary then audits everything, makes sure that the vote count is accurate. Then it gets put up on a screen and everyone looks at it. And then if anyone has any issues with it, they can go then go challenge it and clean it up. And then the vote gets announced. That got, got compound this year because it's that same process. But now you have delegates all over the country. OK, because people are at home. You have delegation chairs who are not there physically. So it took a lot longer for delegation chairs to deliver their tally sheets because online delegation chairs can't go physically deliver a tally sheet. So you also have people who it essentially was the same process as the online convention. So we did it the same way we did it. Well, they delivered a tally sheet to a, a, a um, Google Drive box and whatnot. But again, you had people who just uh, had a tough time collecting, finding all their delegates' votes. And again, each state could decide to do it differently. Um, you know, you had all these little issues. Okay, and then there was, um, so it took a while. So that first vote took like two, maybe three hours, I think two hours when it was all said and done to get the first vote for chair. Um, we ended up doing two, and then what happened is that we ended up doing two, two rounds for chair. So about two hours per vote. And um, we tried to get some more business done during the second vote, but I think the second vote pretty much happened. I'm trying to remember what we did during the second. We, I think we did go visit some other stuff. So during the first ballot, I wanted to see how long it would take. So I didn't want to rush to get other business done. Um, so I knew how long a ballot would take. And then we needed to, you know, at some point bring up candidates to speak and whatnot. So I took advantage of that time to start bringing candidates up to speak. I don't remember exactly what happened during the second ballot. I think we revisited some things. I It's escaping me at the moment. But well, we finally got the chair's results by the end of the, by the end of day three. Um, but we had lost a lot of time, and we had basically half a day left to pretty much do all the other elections, and we were able to get the vice chair nominations as well. So that's what was it. We did ballot two, and then we started working on the the vice chair elections and getting vice chair nominations and whatnot, and that kind of ran the clock to the end of the day. Um. So with that. We go into the third, fourth day, and the f- last day is always... Um, and then also on day three, that's when Dad Logan uh, steps up and helps me uh, with the speaking cue. And he brings his laptop, becomes, a, becomes part of the stage crew, um, and really, really helps make things a lot smoother. And, and again, also props to Dan Fishman, each day kind of refining his process as well. Um, everything kept getting smoother each day. We kept kind of figuring out what the right way to do things is each day better and better. But then on the fourth day, what generally happens, if you've been to the previous conventions, this is what always happens. Everyone's kind of a little bit more restless because they want to get stuff done. But so everyone's trying to propose motions to kind of shorten things. But then those motions end up taking a bit of time to undertake. And then again, because we had to kind of modify the way we were voting. So basically, the people online were voting through Zoom. People in the room were voting through a rising vote because doing a voice vote was really misleading in that room because of the, the echoes. Okay, it was just... Uh, one vote sounded a lot louder than it actually was because of the echoes in that room because it was really bad acoustics which is added on to everything else um, so th- basically every vote took like four or five minutes you know so that was another time sink that we had so anytime anything come up a motion for the a suspension of the rules even if it failed it took five to six minutes to complete uh, really slowing things down okay and that was just the, it was the best we could do with what we had under the circumstances we were in. It did get cleaned up. You know, we got we got pretty good at doing those votes after a while, so it was probably like three, four minutes towards the end. But they still took up a lot of time. So we finally were able to get back onto the elections, and we very efficiently were able to dispose with all the nominations and of, of the pre- following races and get those ballots out, which was the most important thing. As long as those ballots are out... And there was a motion that allowed a plurality to be elected um, for at-large and judicial committee. That means once those ballots are out, we're going to have a result. We're going to have a, a judicial committee. We're going to have at-large. And that was the main thing. As long as there's an LNC, the party can function. And that was the most important thing. 
Okay, I really wanted to see if we can at least get to one bit of platform before the end of the day, at least. But unfortunately, the the very the very end that last like thirty minutes just got super chaotic. Everyone trying to figure out whether they're Jorn, even though the simplest thing would have just been to just, just go the four thirty. Um, but instead, we there was a, a bit of it broke into kind of chaos there was, there was that lower last 30 minutes and there was no extension no adjournment motion it just ended we just hit the clock the meeting was over and i mean that's happened before it happened in 2018 i was i didn't wasn't there for that last day in 2016 um so that's what happens it was disappointing um at that point i w- it wasn't so much that the meeting ended that way but during those few days you know i was definitely in a different mindset like once i kind of found my sea legs um it was more like i was sort of on this automatic keel where i wasn't even thinking about you know how i felt in a sense and when the day was over all the emotions that kind of accumulated over the four days and then the presentation of a gift of a sign a joe jorgensen sign that was signed by several of the delegates that was given to me that last day all these emotions that were bottled up just kind of released that last minute and uh, which was a beautiful moment because many people came up to the stage and hugged me and just kind of you know uh it was just you know the feeling of camaraderie during those days was great. While there was a few people who made lives a little bit more difficult or were rude, it was fine. Um, and then I have to give props to the people who challenged me regularly. Um, you know, people like Aaron Starr and Nick Sawark, where, you know, they, with a lot of points of order, when they, some of them forced me to, like, just really have to like take control of the room and make decisions and make rulings and just stick with them. And in other situations, they gave me really useful points of order that prevented me from going down some really long rabbit holes and just moving things along. So, you know, it's give or take. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we could have all, um, as delegates, as, as people done better. Um, but everyone who was in charge of putting things together, did a phenomenal job. Susan Hogarth with the credentials committee, the amount of work they were having to do to do something that was never done before, managing a credentials list of delegates who were online and in person and trying to audit that and figure out who's where and do that. that that's an amazing work that hasn't been done before. Okay, same thing with being a secretary in such an event, being tellers for elections in such an event. Um, everything was unprecedented. Everything had never been done before and the way we thought we were going to do it going into it was no longer an option. So we were, you know, we had to do, we did an amazing, to me it was a miracle, um, that what we did, what we, we, what we were able to do considering every possible headwind being there, okay? I mean, you're talking about technical difficulties, you're talking about really bad acoustic and that makes it really hard to hear, okay? Um, talking about uh, just sort of, the, 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 the weirdness of sort of managing people who are online and offline and trying to keep them together and not, 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 um, and dealing with also just all the random issues as we went along. So, uh, overall, I felt very positive, very proud of what was done. I don't think that was the smoothest convention there, there was or ever will be. I don't think that was the, you know, far as, but it was never going to be that. Okay. But it, but it very easily could have been a mess. It could have easily been a failure where we left with no LNC. We were, that, that could have easily happened under their circumstances. Okay? But every time there was something that was going to end it, every time there was something that could have been a roadblock to prevent us from moving forward, we overcame. And we got something done to me in what will probably be some of the toughest circumstances in doing a national convention there ever was and ever will be because there were bylaws proposals that will clean up a lot of the things that were passed. Um, A lot of the lessons learned will be learned if we have to have to do a hybrid convention again. I don't know if we will. Um, And more than likely, we won't need to do a hybrid convention two years from now. Um, You know, or, you know, there's, but we learned a lot. So all in all, I'm very proud of what was done. Um, I very much am ecstatic and super happy to have spent the time with people like Richard Brown, Data Logan, Karen Ann Harlows, Susan Hogarth, 
who were with me in the trenches and really doing some amazing stuff. I mean, without them, um, I don't know if I could have held it together four days. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the time spent was me just, at, you know, just getting, you know, always trying to hear multiple points of view um, or just hearing different people's thoughts just because sometimes when someone says even, even if they say the same thing slightly different, it just might click what you need to do. And so a lot of that time was just kind of us as a team, being a team and figuring out how to move forward each step of the way. And, you know, it, it was an experience that I would say it's kind of like, you know, you go through warfare and, and if you do, the people who you were in your unit are probably people you're going to be close to for the rest of your life because you've had a unique experience that no one else will really understand or appreciate as far as what you went through. And the people who were on that stage, that's how I feel about them. I feel like we all had to go through something. We all had to, that no one will ever truly, truly appreciate the hills we had to jump over during those days and the headwinds that we found, um, yet still survived more than those people on that stage. And, you know, my endearment to them will be eternal for that. Um, but my, my, my endearment to the party will be eternal for the experience that I had just gone through and the deep, deep appreciation for um, the kindness everyone showed. And that was, to me, one of the most beautiful things that through such a hard time, people put aside a lot and people focus on working together a lot more than on other things to show that at the end of the day, all our personal differences, all our all the factions, all that, at the end of the day, it's all well and good, but when it, when it comes down to brass tack and something needs to get done, we are family, and we will, will work together to support each other and get ourselves across that finish line. And to, while, again, there was those few people who, you know, want to be difficult just to be difficult, or not cooperative, not to be not cooperative, the vast majority of people were, you know, truly in this together. This is, it was truly felt um, as my 2018 campaign slogan, we were being libertarian together. And, uh, you know, I couldn't think of a better way to end my two years as vice chair than in a moment of being libertarian together. And those are my reflections. Again, thank you to all the COC, Sam Goldstein, uh, Whitney Bilyeu, uh, Alicia Matson, Betty Rose Ryan, who put in Aaron Adams, who put in amazing work uh, during that convention and I can't imagine the burdens that were placed on them because it wasn't just during the convention but the last two years they've done so much work like I mean I worked my butt off those three days but they've been working their butt off for two years um, and it's amazing and then I also want to say a thank you to John Phillips who was very supportive very uh, just a good friend during those few days and uh, you know helping me keep it together um, and just everybody else everyone was great um, there's so many people I'd like to thank. There's so many people who deserve appreciation. Again, I want to re- special appreciate the Jim Turney for really being uh, a hero in the setting of everything up. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing experience. Something I think was a historic moment in this party. Um, a historic and uniting ending to what was looking to be sort of a contentious year, a contentious, uh, one of the most contentious periods uh, in this party's history that I can remember. Because it wasn't just a normal factional fighting, but also all this tension and cabin fever when people have during this weird era we're in, where we all have much more free time than probably would like. Um, we're all feeling isolated from the rest of the world. Um, but we got to a good place. Was it the place that we all wish we would have gotten to? But no, we got to a good place and we got there together. And to me, that's what matters. That's, that's what to me tells me that the Liberal Party isn't going anywhere. We are, we are a unit. We are a family that is here to get shit done. Okay? And we're going to learn from this and come back stronger. And we have a great LNC for the next two years. You've got an amazing team. Um, a lot of fresh faces. Um, a, lot, a lot of hitting of reset buttons. I think this kind of overall was a nice period to look forward um, to see people with sort of, you know, fresh bridges, fresh faces who won't, don't have the baggage of the, of the wars of yesterday, of the battles that were fought yesterday, who can just now work together and, uh, you know, see the party through to, to new heights. 
So I'm feeling good. My name's Alex Merced from now. I'm just Alex Merced from AlexMerced.com. I'll see you guys around.